At midnight in the first moments of the year 2000, what will happen to the computers you depend on? Do you know where they are, what they do, and what shape they're in? If they are infected with a Millennium Bug, will they be debugged and ready to run properly? If not, what could they do to your bank account, your job, your future? Next in this special report on Y2K, the Millennium Bug's deadliest secret. Learn about the latest disclosures. Find out what could happen to you and your loved ones. Y2K is short for year 2000. The date is now less than 500 days away. When we passed the 500-day warning, computer professionals began to admit that America has run out of time to fix all the computers we depend on for food, water, money, defense, and electricity. In these big mainframe computers are millions upon hundreds of millions of lines of code that run programs. Some of those lines refer to dates. The code indicates days, months, and years, but not centuries. For five years, the media has been telling us that this is the Y2K problem that must be fixed. The year 98, for example, must be changed to read 1998, and the year 00 must be changed to read 2000, or our computers will not compute after midnight, December 31, 1999. The Wall Street Journal called this code repair challenge the software conversion issue and said it brings a chill to those who realize its seriousness. A failure to complete this conversion would mean a major disabling. As Newsweek magazine put it, this is dangerous because American civilization has become totally dependent on these mainframes. What's more, the computers are so interconnected that a shutdown of even a few of them could bring the economy to a halt. Not a grinding halt, but a sudden halt. Every American depends on an average of 256 computers every day for vital services like electricity, water, food, fuel, and paychecks. According to the experts, if the mainframes are not fixed, totally fixed, this is what could happen. On Saturday morning, January 1st, 2000, banks could lose all your records and all your money. Your city water supply could go off for an indefinite period. Your electric company, also controlled by mainframe computer software, could close for months or years. Your local natural gas supply could be cut off when the gas company computers crash. Your favorite commercial airline, controlled by several mainframe systems, could cancel all operations. Your brokerage firm could lose all your investment information. Your local hospital's intensive care, surgical, and prescription dispensing systems are also at risk of shutting down for months. Your local telephone company knows it's in danger and may be unable to provide you with even the service to call an operator or 911. Police department functions at the 911 center are also controlled by a power mainframe and could crash even before the phone lines go dead. Every major retail store in your town sells goods brought in by railroad. Railroads cannot move cars from track to track without mainframe computers and cannot keep track of what's in the cars without mainframe software. If those mainframes go down, the trains will be stuck. And it will be as though the American economy is frozen to the tracks of progress. All because computer programs were two digits short beginning at the dawn of the computer age and because programmers are finding it impossible to fix one line of code without hurting other lines of code. Bob Beamer is one of the inventors of computer programming, and he was there at the beginning as the father of word processing, ASCII 2 programming, the escape sequence, the COBOL business language, and many other inventions. Beamer has been blamed for causing the Y2K problem because he is the man who made two-digit programming possible. But Beamer tried to do something about Y2K way back in 1968. He warned the Nixon administration about the implications of two-digit dates and asked for White House assistance in leading an international effort to have corporations and governments change to four-digit years before the year 2000. But President Nixon refused to take the initiative, and Beamer went into retirement frustrated. 
And if Brother Nixon had signed off on that thing, I think we would never be in this fix. But I, al I always consider that a major failure on my part for not somehow getting him to sign that because had we done that, I'm sure we could have gotten people using four-digit years in 1970. Beamer emerged from retirement in 1996 with a brilliant idea that can help programmers out of an impossible software programming situation. But Bob Beamer realizes the Y2K problem holds an even more mysterious secret than the challenges of code repair. The worst part is the embedded chips. Those are the little things that run your coffee maker, open and close the security gates on a bank or a plant. Uh, one of the famous things occurred here in Texas, Texas Power. They took down a power plant for routine maintenance and said, hey, while we're doing it, we'll replace all the computer chips to control these things to be working with year 2000. And they did, very nicely done. Good, good thinking. They put it back together and they put it in service and it lasted 20 seconds and died. After two days, <clears throat> they found inside the smokestack, way, way up, a little computer monitoring smoke for the EPA. That killed them. They were lucky to find that in two days, I think. But when you've got them inside natural gas lines, oil pipelines, on the outside of super tankers bringing you oil, in satellites where you can't get at them or find them, that's what gets sticky, really sticky. Students of the complex Y2K mystery compare their study to the peeling of an onion. The more you peel that onion, the more you discover it's a much deeper problem than most people are aware of. Uh, and the problem really has, as, well, first of all, it arises from the fact that we're used to thinking of the date out of six digits. Two digits for the month, two digits for the day, and two digits for the year. And most of the programming and technology investment of the last 50 years tended to view the year 2000 as a distant abstraction, never realizing it's coming rather inexorably upon our immediate horizon. And um, when the uh, uh, 99 shifts over to 00, uh, many chips will be confused. The good ones will stop. The bad ones will generate noise of all strange kinds. So. Um, there are probably at least three levels to the problem technically. Most people immediately recognize the realities for large-scale mainframe computers. These are the giant machines that most major corporations and certainly most government agencies depend upon. And these aren't obsolete machines. Many of us in the computer industry tend to shrug them off. There's about a 20% uh, 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 of the population is less than two years old. And that market is growing substantially also along with everything else. So there are lots of them around. And um, the problem is they're programmed in 500 different languages, many of which are no longer supported. So trying to go back and repair old programs is a very complex management problem, not a big technical problem, but it's going to require more manpower and more calendar time than is available. And so that's, that's the problem most people focus on. There's a second level of the problem, and that's personal computers, and I'll dismiss that because most of them are not in life-threatening situations, so let me not waste our time at the moment to get into that right now. But the most fearsome part of the problem, as I personally view it, are the microchips. These are things about the size of your fingernail that have millions of transistors on them, and we pump seven billion of these into our economy every year. There's over 25 billion around in various applications. There's several problems to this, and this perhaps dramatizes the seriousness of what we're dealing with here. These, first of all, there's no way to automate the, uh, te the testing or the uh, repair of these devices because, first of all, they're all different kinds. They're soldered in, in many cases, in equipment that's no longer manufactured. It's been installed in refineries or pipelines or manufacturing plants or robots, you name it, over the years. And many of them are not necessarily in calendar functions and yet turn out to be, much to everyone's shock, calendar sensitive for some strange technical reasons. So the real problem is, first of all, accessibility, because you can't get at these things. They're in satellites. They're buried in pipelines. Uh, they're uh, uh, under the ocean floor. 
uh, their scattered in equipment. General Motors Corporation has 600,000 pieces of equipment, their estimate, uh, that have such chips in them that have to be checked out. They have 60,000 robots. And uh, let me just focus on manufacturing for the moment since I started there. The manufacturing environment in the United States has been finely tuned to a technique that's called just-in-time inventory. In other words, parts arrive at an assembly plant not a day early nor a day late. They, they want them there when they need them, no sooner, no later, more or less. Well, if a vendor, he not only he, he can't ship early and he can't ship late and, and, and uh, not perturb the process, and uh, auto industry uh, deals with tens of thousands of vendors. So the whole economy is subtly uh, tuned, that, therefore very fragile. And uh, scattered throughout this entire investment are chips tucked away in equipments that most people don't even know are there, you take it for granted, that can, uh, that come uh, Jan uh, December 31, 1999, have some likelihood of acting unpredictably. And if it's only a few percent, it can cause major disruptive problems. Problem-causing chips could be anywhere, and that few percent could total 1.5 billion chips any one of which could cause major disruptive problems. Experts say the failure of even one chip could start a dangerous ripple effect that could be felt across the nation as one dying system causes another dependent system to die. Lucent Technologies just began testing the chips in their systems and system devices and have discovered bad chips are causing failures in four out of five devices. Every device with a chip is at risk of failure from the heart pacemaker to the telephone, from the Game Boy toy to the nuclear missile silo. Today's chips are capable of processing 66 million instructions per second. They can control hundreds of separate functions. But many of these technological marvels are vulnerable to complete failure because of the Millennium Bug, a computer time measurement that measures by design no time later than December 31, 1999. Chips made as recently as last year contain defective time clocks and time programs that were actually burned into the firmware in such a way that the chips cannot be reprogrammed. They were trying to make them cheap, 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 cheap. They knew the problem when they designed those chips because those things have only been in, in really bulk in the last four years. So it was absolutely a design problem on the part of the engineers very, very disgraceful. And when the lawyers come around, sue them, and you know that this is going to be worse than <coughs> breast cancer, <coughs> smoking, asbestos, and cor Corvettes <laughs> combined. Well, what the chip designers did was disgraceful. They built chips that would become obsolete and useless. It was unintentional, but it's still inexcusable because installed chips that become suddenly useless can destroy any system they're plugged into. We estimate that there are more than 35 billion of these generic chips out there. Like in the average hospital, it, for example, it has some 35,000 devices, each of which could contain one or more of these fatally designed chips. Now let me show you the problem with the design. To make these chips really cheap, the designers made them versatile, when they, and then they produced them in bulk. They crowded in as many functions as they could, so it would be a one-size-fits-all chip. They made about seven million per year. And companies that, that uh, buy these chips and install them in circuit, circuit boards just love them because they can plug in just about anywhere. And so when a system company like an automaker, a toy maker, a defense contractor, or a microwave oven maker buys this little cheap chip, he gets all the functions he needs, plus dozens more that he doesn't need, all for about a dollar. That's the cost of this really cheap, generic chip. So he gets all the functions he needs, and the extras that he doesn't need just sit there unused, and usually the extras would not cause any problems at all. But look at this. One of the extras that's in these cheap chips is a clock, and it's infected with the Millennium Virus that timekeeping or date keeping function could shut down a whole system if the chip is not replaced. Most manufacturers don't realize the clock is built into the chip. 
If the system they created with an inexpensive chip doesn't keep time or does not need to keep time, the manufacturer assumes there is no Millennium threat posed by that chip. But Y2K engineers have discovered that every mass-produced chip must be checked for date-sensitive functions. Now, if the manufacturers had designed and built their own chips for their own circuit boards, their own machines, we would not have this problem. The chips would work flawlessly for dozens of years. And, and let me show you the reason they didn't do it. It's the price tag. It costs roughly $100,000 to design and build a custom chip that would not be all that different from the $1 variety. So the decision to go with a $1 chip turns out to have been a potentially deadly decision. Hardware engineers report that most systems with faulty chips will crash in January 2000 if the chips aren't replaced. They caution that some systems with unreplaced chips may continue to function after January 2000, but could crash later at unexpected times. This is because some chips will keep working until they think it's January 1, 2000, and that could be any time up until 2006. You have to go in and find every appearance of the date, every place of the date. In, uh, in the hardware, you have to find every chip, test every chip, replace every chip, and make sure that they're all working fine again, and you're all going to have to do it in less than 700 days. It's a monumental task. As I said earlier, it's the things you don't know, the things that you don't uh, tackle that will end up killing you when the year 2000 hits. So you've got to check every one of them. Texaco estimates that a typical offshore oil rig uses approximately 10,000 embedded ships. They have guessed that 12% are not year 2000 compliant. Some fraction of these chips are installed below the surface or in other hard to reach places. The typical electric utility uses tens of thousands of systems. 500 different systems are expected to contain faulty chips and the time required to test these is estimated at 21 months. The cost to test is estimated to be $30 million per utility. Some utilities have not begun to test. The industry doesn't even have estimates for the time it takes to replace the bad chips because no utility has finished the testing. Very few had even started testing as of August 1998. These little tiny chips are scattered throughout our society and our lives depend on them. And, what, and uh, tragically, most managements throughout the world have been asleep on this. But the world is waking up to the embedded chip problem. When we come back, discover why the embedded chip problem is considered the Millennium Bug's deadliest secret. On January 1st, 2000, what will become of the American economy? What will become of your job, your money, your home, and your future? Find out in this powerful new book. According to reviewers, the answers are straightforward and thorough. This is the book that goes to the heart of the Y2K crisis to tell how long the crisis will last and exactly what you must do to prepare. It could indeed save your life. What will become of us? Outlines a 15-step plan that shows you how to protect everything you've worked for. It tells you exactly what you will need and where you can get it. Call 1-800-771-2147, extension 85. What will become of us? Riveting, says military scientist. Chilling, but deadly accurate, says the American Family Policy Institute. Call 1-800-771-2147, extension 85. Get the answers and guidance you need to be ready for Y2K. In 1984, an industrial disaster killed 7,000 and injured 300,000 in Bhopal, India, when a deadly chemical cloud escaped from a modern plant and spread across the city. According to computer experts, the plant was equipped with some 17,000 computer chips. All were working fine but one. The malfunction was the culprit that sent a deadly chemical mist over the city. These chips really are the Millennium Bug's deadliest secret. While everyone's frantically been trying to fix their mainframe code, these chips have been hiding, pretending they're just too smart to have any destructive date problems. But many of them do, and we just don't know which ones. 
engineers are just now learning how to test for chips that might be infected with the Millennium Bug. The effort requires sifting through 40 to 50 billion chips to find ones that don't pass the tests. Chips in electrical power plants, for example, must be tested in at least 10 different ways. Some chips are impossible to test. Others are impossible to replace. The scariest words you'll hear computer experts say in 1999 are, we're out of time. The scariest words you'll hear right now, today, are, these processors are in everything. These processors are in everything. A number of the automobiles will not work in the year 2000. A number of signal lights will not work. Of course, if the cars can't move, it doesn't really matter if the signal lights work. Microwave ovens will fail. If we don't have power, that's not really a big issue. But there are a number of little things that even if we maintain power, people don't realize what we would lose. But I don't believe that we will have power more than seven days, maybe 14 days into the year 2000. Perhaps the, the deadliest threat in the U.S. is power company failure. Everything stops in urban America if power fails, if the electricity goes off. Of course, software could cause this, software, software failure. But the biggest threat of all is chip failure in the distribution grid, sometimes called the power grid. Many power companies don't know where the vulnerable chips are. Now, one electric utility vice president just told a U.S. Senate panel that they've located over 170,000 chips in their plant and that it will take at least two hours per chip to test each chip, to test each chip two hours. That means they need to hire 500 experienced engineers in order to finish the testing before the 99 plant test deadline. What I want to know is where they will find even one engineer who knows how to test these chips. The power companies have serious problems of all kinds, both the big machines and the chips and so forth. There is a recognition, a growing recognition, among the people that are in the senior levels of our uh, power establishment that there's a high likelihood of major brownouts, maybe some blackouts. How deep the problem will be and how long it's going to last is uh, problematical. It won't take much to shut down a power system. And, uh, and, and it can be pretty scary if that happens because the question is really going to be how long will it take to get it back up? If it takes years to fix your computer systems before the year 2000, why would you think it's going to take less time to fix them afterwards? Uh, worst case scenario, I don't even want to talk about because it, it's, it would be a movie, a made for movie, uh, or made for TV movie that would be just too scary to actually contemplate. On Capitol Hill, testimony by power company employees has been chilling. On June 12, 1998, Senator Christopher Dodd, a Connecticut Democrat, said, quite honestly, I think we're no longer at the point of asking whether or not there will be any power disruptions, but we are now forced to ask how severe the disruptions are going to be. In May 1998, David Hall, an embedded systems consultant at Cara Corporation, warned 80 congressional aides of certain to come power outages. He said, every test I have seen done on an electrical power plant has caused it to shut down, period. I know of no plant or facility investigated to this date that is passed without Y2K problems. On June 12, 1998, an employee of North American Electric Reliability Council testified before a Senate panel. The employee drove home his points with this statement. Senators, I have just bought myself a 12 kilowatt diesel generator and 3,000 gallons of diesel. The whole system is going down. In July, the panel chairman revealed to the National Press Club just where the utilities stand. If Y2K were this weekend instead of 72 weekends from now, he said, civilization as we know it would come to an end. Nobody knows how deep it'll be or how long it'll last, and therein lies part of the problem. We have uh, very substantial resources being exercised to try to just calibrate what we're facing here, and it changes every week. But I can tell you the more we look at it, the more serious it becomes, because you take power as one example, you take water, um, you take our manufacturing establishment, you take our banking establishment, financial services, you talk telecommunications, uh, and on it goes. You talk about our defense establishment. 
I could uh, give you anecdotal examples already experienced in each of these fields that indicate that we're facing some major unknowns. What is disturbing about the entire structure is the infrastructure of this country because all these things depend on one another. The average airport is an illustration of infrastructure interdependence. Tens of thousands of computer systems work together. At the heart of every system is a mainframe computer or a microprocessor. From telecommunications to communications to cargo, failure of one system could shut down the rest. Mark Secord is an airline captain. He has a bright career ahead of him in one of the nation's most successful, most high-tech airlines. He could easily find a position at the top of the company. But instead, he's found something he thinks is more valuable. It's about as far away as one could get from airline technology and the embedded chip problem. What I was looking for in a place is, is something that, a place that provided an opportunity to be self-sufficient. A place that would allow me to grow food, my own food, to raise animals, and to raise a variety of animals, to have a garden, to uh, have a place with enough space where I could bury a tank in the ground and store some fuel. When I look ahead, I see a real problem on the horizons with Y2K. And uh, those who live in the city, I think, are going to be more vulnerable. The bottom line, uh, supply and demand, the demand for water, the demand for energy, uh, the dependency that's, that's, that's already on people in the city will be intensified if those items that they are dependent upon are cut off. Interdependency is the word that, uh, that, that sticks out like a neon light. I mean, we are all dependent upon everybody else. I mean, I can't go unless the fuelers have done their job. They can't do it unless the mechanics have checked over and certified the aircraft. And they can't do it unless there's food. I mean, there's water supplied on the aircraft. There's, there's the air traffic control facility. The fact these are the people that keep us separated from one another in flight so we don't hit each other. And all this is run by power and electricity, who, which is being generated by other people who are working. And again, the interconnectivity of our society and it's all run on computers in large measure. I fly a computer. And if these things aren't programmed or there's a, if there's a, a chip or something that's malfunctioning in them, in them, then everybody's affected by this. My job will be affected. Everyone will be affected. There'll be no one who's, who's completely protected unless, again, you're self-sufficient and you don't need to be dependent upon a job to get money to go to a store to buy milk and eggs. You've, you've got that right here in your farm. Secord is a disciplined pilot who does not overreact. His conclusions about the future of his airline and his job are based on solid evidence. The average airline has 17,000 suppliers whose computers are not ready for Y2K. KLM has 160 date systems per plane. United has 40,000 separate programs that run its systems. British Airways is spending $300 million to fix their software and hardware, and the FAA has 18,000 subsystems. The FAA has admitted they are only 6% finished with Y2K repairs and will not make the year 2000 deadline. This means airports could be as quiet as Captain Secord's farm because of a grounded economy brought down by the Millennium Bug. In summary, the bite of the Millennium Bug is now predicted to be far worse than first imagined. It threatens each system we depend on for the basics. The potential chip failure in electrical plants alone are enough to thrust America into a decade-long economic depression. Without electricity, water, trains, phones, and city commerce, all Americans will be forced to temporarily lean on agricultural methods to supply their own food, water, and livelihoods. With barely a year to prepare, every American must take steps that are diligent, methodical, and continual until December 31st, 1999. For more information about how to prepare for the Y2K crisis, call 1-800 771-2147, extension 85.